right, so let's apply everything that we talked about with periodic trends, with electronic configurations, and everything that we've talked about for the last couple of weeks. Now let's start applying that to multiple atoms. How do we connect atoms together? So let's go back to valence electrons, something that we talked about in the previous chapter. Remember that valence electrons, these are the outermost electrons. So valence electrons are the outermost electrons. Okay, and valence electrons are the electrons involved in chemical bonding. Oops, let me write that all together. Okay, so the guy who actually thought about this, uh, his name was G.N. Lewis. We've talked about him before. Uh, if you remember when we talked about acids and bases, he actually came up with a theory of acids and bases based on electrons. So uh, G.N. Lewis is known as the father of American chemistry. And uh, he actually came up, he was actually the one of the first chemists that actually thought about how bonds come together, or how atoms come together in bonds. And so his idea in 1918, near the end of World War I, was that atoms combine in order to achieve a more stable electronic configurations. Okay. And when, when atoms are isoelectronic with a noble gas, that's when they achieve their maximum stability. Okay, And to keep track of the electron, the valence electrons and bonds, G. and Lewis uh, created a system of dots called Lewis dot structures. So let's talk about this. So this is something that we're going to talk about. This is something that we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail uh, in the next video. But to introduce us now, a Lewis dot structure, this is the symbol of the element. And one dot for each valence electron. in an atom of an element. Okay, so if you notice in family 1A, there's one dot. If you're in family 2A, then you got two dots. If you're in family 4A, four dots, 7A, seven dots, eight, eight dots, and so on. Okay, so with that in mind, we can start talking about our first type of bond, which is the ionic bond. So remember that atoms with very low ionization energies will want to become cations, and ones with high electron affinities will want to become anions. So that is our first bond, the ionic bond. So the way that we define an ionic bond is that this is the electrostatic attraction that holds ions together in an ionic compound. And these groups will come together to form an ionic bond. Now, most likely, as you have probably have seen all throughout this course, cations tend to be metals, and anions tend to be nonmetals. Okay, so let's take a look at an example of an ionic bond, how to form an ionic bond. Let's take a look at lithium fluoride. So lithium has its one valence electron, and then fluorine has seven valence electrons. So let me draw those on, okay? 
And so if you remember the electronic configuration for lithium is 1s2, 2s1. And the electronic configuration for fluorine when was 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. Okay. And so what we want to do is form this compound, lithium fluoride, where fluorine has eight valence electrons, lithium has none. So that means that lithium is going to have a positive charge. Fluorine is going to have a negative charge because it took in that one valence electron. But lithium lost that one valence electron, so it's now isoelectronic with helium. Fluorine is now isoelectronic with neon. Okay. So even though I'm drawing out this reaction in one step, it's actually a two-step process. So let's take a look at how this happens. So in the first step, we're going to have lithium with its one valence electron, and somehow lithium's got to lose its valence electron, so it becomes lithium ion, and then we've released that one electron. Okay. And then in the second step, we've got fluorine with its seven valence electrons, Okay, and it takes in that one electron and it becomes the fluoride ion. Okay, now it turns out, if you think about it this way, lithium has its one valence electron, removes it and becomes an anion, it becomes a cation. This is ionization energy. That step is ionization energy, and fluorine picking up that one electron to become an, uh, become an anion, that is electron affinity. And so if we add up these two steps together, what we get is that lithium plus the fluorine atom, okay, becomes lithium fluoride. So that's kind of cool how it happens. So we're taking ionization energy and electron affinity to make that happen. It turns out that we have to have a couple more steps to go along with it, but this is this is pretty much the basics. <coughs> okay, so we now know how to how you know what atoms or what what elements are most likely going to be used in it to form an ionic bond. But here's the question: how do we know how stable? an ionic compound is going to be. So in order to answer that question, uh, the overall stability of a solid ionic compound depends on the interactions of all the ions and not just one cation with one anion. So in order for us to quantify, we have to find a way to quantify this. And the way that we do that is to ca calculate something known as lattice energy. So the way we quantify is known as lattice energy. The energy required to completely separate one mole of a solid ionic compound into gaseous ions. Okay. So in other words, what we want to look at is taking something like this, lithium fluoride, which is solid, and eventually what we want to do is get to this point where you have lithium ion that's in the gas state, and then fluoride ion, which is also in the gas state. Okay, now we can't, unfortunately, we can't measure lattice energy directly, but if we know the structure and we know the composition of the compound, we can calculate this by using Coulomb's law. So we have to borrow this from physics. Coulomb's law says this, the potential energy between two ions is directly proportional
to the product of their charges. And inversely, proportional to the distance of separation between them. And we have a we have an equation for this on how to calculate uh, that lattice energy e using Coulomb's law. The energy is going to be equal to a proportionality constant K times the product of the charges. So you're going to have uh, one charge that's positive times another charge that's negative divided by the radius, the distance between the two uh, charges. Now this should be an exothermic process to form a bond, but the way that this number is being given to us, it should be, it's going to be a negative value. So it should, you know, if we multiply the product of the charges, one's positive, one's negative, automatically this energy is going to come out to be negative. Okay. So we, so since we can't directly calculate uh, this number, we can also calculate lattice energy indirectly by assuming that the formation of an ionic compound takes place in a few steps. So this is going to be pretty similar to what we saw with Hess's law. And so the way that we're going to do this is to use something called the Born-Haber process or the Born-Haber cycle. Okay. And so what Born-Haber cycle does is that it relates the lattice energies to ionization energy, electron affinity, and other atomic and molecular properties. And it's going to be, like I said, it's going to be very similar to Hess's law. So let's try this out. We were talking about forming lithium fluoride earlier. So let's work with lithium fluoride. So here's what we want to do. We want to take a look at the formation of lithium, solid lithium, plus half a mole of fluorine, which is in the gas state. And we want to form one mole of lithium fluoride. Okay, so that's what we want to find out. So if we look up, if we calculate the enthalpy of this reaction, okay, if we calculate the enthalpy of this reaction using heats of formation like we talked about back in Chapter 6, the enthalpy for this reaction is going to be a negative 594.1 kilojoules per mole, okay? And that's all well and good, but how do we get to that number? Where, how do we talk about stabilities? So in order to get to the last energy, it's, it's gonna be a, a, a it's gonna be a process. So let's, let's take a look at this. For the first step, what we wanna do is convert solid lithium to gaseous lithium. Okay, so it's solid lithium to gaseous lithium. Okay, and for that, we have to look up the enthalpy for that step. So the enthalpy for step one, which by the way, this process is called sublimation. Okay, if we look up how much energy it's going to cost to, to take one mole of lithium and, and sublime it, it's going to cost us a positive 155.2 kilojoules per mole. So that's actually a cost for us. It's going to cost us that much energy. That's how much we've got to expand, expend to make this happen. Okay. 
All right, so the next step, now that we converted lithium from solid to gas, the next step is to convert fluorine. We're gonna take half a mole of fluorine, half a mole of F2, and what we're gonna do is break it into one mole of just fluorine atoms, okay? So this part, this is called dissociation. What we're trying to do is break apart the diatomic bond, the diatomic molecule, so that way we just have, we just have the fluorine atoms by themselves. We can also look this up. The enthalpy of this step is going to be a positive 75.3 kilojoules per mole. Okay. All right, so the next step, so I'll tell you what, before we do anything else, let's add these two values up. If we take positive 155.2 and a positive 75.3, right now, and I'm going to write this on the, on the left-hand side, right now it's costing us about 230.5 kilojoules per mole. Okay, and keep in mind, at the end of the day, we got to get to that negative 594.1. So right off the bat, this is costing us some energy. So it's costing us money up front. So here's the next step. We want to take lithium because remember, lithium is in the gaseous state. We need to remove one mole of electrons. So we want to convert lithium to lithium ion and release one mole of electrons. That is ionization energy. Okay, so if we go back to that chart back in the last chapter and look that up, the enthalpy for that step, the ionization energy, is actually a positive 520 kilojoules per mole. So if we add that 520 to the 230, our running total right now, we're at about 750.5 kilojoules per mole. So we got to start getting some energy back. We're, we're in a hole quite a bit. So here's where we start getting some of the energy back. In the next step, what we want to do is take that one mole of electrons that we just released from, from the lithium ions, and we want to add those to the fluorine atoms. So we would take the fluorine atoms in the gas state, add one mole of electrons to it to get fluoride ion. Okay, And this is electron affinity. That's what electron affinity does. And if we look up the value for one mole of fluorine, the electron affinity value is going to be a negative 328 kilojoules per mole. So we're starting to get some energy back. We're starting to get some of that energy that we've been supplying back. So if we take 750.5, okay, and subtract 328 from it, it's costing us 422.5. So we're getting some of that energy back that we've been supplying. But here's where it gets good. Now what we want to do is take the one mole of the lithium, gaseous lithium, and now we want to take one mole of the gaseous fluoride ions, and we want to put them together to form lithium fluoride. Okay. Now, this is the part that we don't know. That's, this is, by definition, the reverse of lattice energy. Okay, So that's the part that we need to find out. What is that value? So to figure this all out, what we're going to do is add up all the values that we had previously. So if you remember from step one, okay. so step one was this. You had solid lithium and it became gaseous lithium. And that value was 155.2 kilojoules per mole. And then for step two, we took half a mole of fluorine gas and we dissociated it to just give us one mole of fluorine atoms in the gas state. And that was a cost of 75.3 kilojoules per mole. Okay, for step three, where we use ionization energy, lithium in the gas state becomes lithium ion, so it releases 
the one mole of electrons. And that was a positive 520 kilojoules per mole. Okay. Step four, ion is the, uh, the electron affinity where you have the one mole of fluorine picks up the electrons. One mole of all electrons and we get fluoride ion. And step four was negative 328 kilojoules per mole. Now step five was that one that we were just on. So we take the lithium ion in the gas state plus the fluoride ion in the gas state, add them together to get lithium fluoride. And that's gonna be in the solid state. And so that's the part that we don't know. But if we add up all these steps, we have the enthalpy of the reaction, which was lithium plus half a mole of fluorine gas yields lithium fluoride, which is a solid. We actually know that one. The uh, enthalpy of the reaction was negative 594.1 kilojoules per mole. So what we do, in order to get to that value, we know that if we add up steps one through four, that value was a positive 422.5, okay? So what we're gonna do is take this negative 594.1 and subtract everything that we know. So the subtract 422.5 from it, and that tells us that the total energy in step five would be negative 1016.6 kilojoules per mole. So that's how much energy is released when a lithium ion and a fluoride ion, when you have one mole of lithium and one mole of fluoride ions and they come together, that's how much energy is released. And so this diagram is actually kind of walking us through. It's costing us energy to get to that point, but once we get the ions ready, it's going to release a ton of energy in order to form that solid ionic compound. So the way that we determine, the way that we can actually figure out stabilities of ionic compounds is to look at these lattice energies. Look at how much energy it's going to cost to break apart these ions. Okay. And we can also compare lattice energies to melting points because this is actually a pretty interesting idea too. If we take a look at lattice energies and melting points, let's take a look at just one family. I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw a line here. So lithium fluoride, the lattice energy was 1017 kilojoules per mole. The melting point is at 845. But if I replace the anion fluoride with chloride, the melting point goes down almost 200 degrees. So it's now, uh, the lattice energy goes down almost 200 degrees, or 200 kilojoules. The melting point goes down almost 200 degrees. It's down to a 610, okay? If I replace chlorine with a bromine, the melting point, it goes down by almost 50 degrees, uh, 50 kilojoules per mole. And the melting point also goes down to about 60 degrees Celsius. If I replace bromine with iodine, the lattice energy goes down, the melting point goes down. So as we change or go down a family with change the ions up, okay, the lattice energies decrease, so they're becoming less and less stable. The melting points also decrease. They become, le they become lower and lower. So that's kind of the cool thing that we're seeing. So the lower the lattice energies, the lower the melting points become. And this also makes sense, helps make sense of some molecular formulas, like, like, like for instance, MgCl2. Why is it that and not MgCl where magnesium has a plus one charge? So we know magnesium prefers to remove both electrons. So the first ionization energy is going to cost us 738 kilojoules, but the second one's almost doubled at 1450. But we know that Mg2 plus has a noble gas configuration. 
But if we look at the energy to remove that second electron and compare it to the lattice energy, which is a positive 25, 27 kilojoules per mole, that lattice energy is more than enough to compensate the energy it's going to cost to remove those electrons with no problem. You still get energy back. And so that's way, way cool. So at this point, this sets us up to now talk about another type of bond, and that's actually what we're going to do next week. We're going to move from the ionic bond and now talk about what happens when atoms share electrons, and that's with the covalent bond.